Live from New Delhi, you're watching DD India News, our India's voice to the world. I am Ramesh Ramachandran. Coming up in the next hour, India's Prime Minister Narendra Modi holds election rallies in Maharashtra and Karnataka. Opposition leader Rahul Gandhi holds a public meeting at Bhagalpur in Bihar. Iran says it will respond at maximum level if Israel acts against its interests, plays down the reported Israeli attacks. Fighting rages at Myanmar's border with Thailand forces 200 civilians to flee. And in tennis, the duo of Yuki Bhambri of India and Albeno Olivetti of France seal a place in a Munich Open men's doubles final. First of all, the latest updates on the Russia-Ukraine conflict. Russia's Ministry of Defense has reported Ukrainian drone strikes overnight. 26 drones were detected over the Belgorod region, killing two people. Russia also claimed to have launched multiple attacks on Ukraine's military and energy infrastructure and arms depots. The Russian army destroyed Ukraine's MiG-29 fighter jets and AN-26 military transport planes at a Ukrainian airport. For its part, Ukraine reported attacking Russian command posts, soldiers and military equipment. In some more news, Ukraine on Friday claimed to have downed a Russian strategic bomber for the very first time. The warplane is capable of carrying long-range missiles. But Russia said that the aircraft crashed because of a technical malfunction as it returned to base after carrying out a combat mission. The pilots had ejected, but one of them died. Now, as the conflict enters its 786th day, servicemen fighting near Chasivyar in Donetsk region are waiting for the approval of the U.S. aid bill for Ukraine. The White House has said that they would send shipments of arms to Ukraine as soon as funding request is approved by the House of Representatives. Ukraine's top commander, Colonel General Alexander Sirsky, has warned that the battlefield situation in the east has further worsened. However, Kyiv's brigades in Chasivyar are holding back the attack for now and have been reinforced with ammunition, drones and electronic warfare devices. Meanwhile, U.S. lawmakers in the lower house of the country's legislature are due to vote on Saturday on a series of long-awaited foreign aid bills that include funding for Ukraine, Israel and the Indo-Pacific region. The lawmakers could give around $95 billion in U.S. funding to allies if the bills are first passed by the House of Representatives and then by the upper chamber called the Senate. And DD India's Caroline Malone has more from Washington, D.C. It's taken months to get here, but congressional lawmakers are on the verge of making progress on approving foreign aid packages after much debate and controversy. Republican House Speaker Mike Johnson got through a procedural vote formally on Friday, which opens up the aid bills for debate before voting to pass them. That's even though 55 members of the Republican Party, his own party, voted against it, including members of the far-right House Freedom Caucus, who have said they may also move to oust him from the Speaker role in protest of the bills. Well, Johnson was only able to get to the next stage with the support of the Democrats, who, in a highly unusual bipartisan move, actually gave 165 of their votes to the courts. Well, these bills come in four parts, $60 billion for Ukraine, $26 billion for Israel, $8 billion for the Indo-Pacific, that's largely to support Taiwan, and a wider national security bill that includes moves against Russia and China, such as on fentanyl, and insisting that Beijing divest its ownership of the social platform TikTok. Well, if the bills pass in the House, they're due to be voted on on Saturday, 
they could then move on to the higher chamber as one complete bill. Senators are supposed to be in recess next week, but they could be called back to vote given the urgency of this funding. Caroline Malone in Washington, DD India. And joining me from Moscow is my colleague Dasha Chernyshova. Dasha, Ukraine claims to have successfully shot down a Russian strategic bomber, which is a first for Ukraine. But Russia's defense ministry has said that the bomber crashed because of a quote unquote technical malfunction. What more can you tell us? Well, that's right. The Russian Ministry of Defense has confirmed that the Chu-22 M3 strategic bomber has indeed crashed in Russia's southern Stavropol region. It happened on Friday, and the understanding from the Russian Ministry of Defense is that the reason, the cause for this crash was the tactical malfunction. Now, everybody in Russia has seen the footage of the plane circulating on uh, on social media, the how this bomber was actually uh, spinning while it was crashing towards the ground. Now, we understand that there were at least four pilots one of them has died according to the russian authorities two others have been found on the ground and the search and rescue operation is ongoing for the fourth one uh the russian ministry of defense has uh not commented on the ukrainian claims but obviously the investigation is ongoing we also understand that these bomber was returning from the uh after completing the combat tasks also, Dasha, U.S. lawmakers, we are told, are all set to vote on billions of dollars in aid for Ukraine. How's Moscow viewing this development? Well, there is the negative attitude towards any weapons supplies and any military aid to Ukraine in Russia. Moscow insists that because of those Western supplies of the military equipment, this operation is still ongoing because to remind you, one of the goals that Moscow outlined from the very beginning was to demilitarize Ukraine, but having more weapons from the NATO countries, the operation will have to last longer. And that's why Moscow will have to continue to target uh, what it calls the military infrastructure of Ukraine. Ukraine with its high precision long range uh, weapons. The understanding in Moscow is that the West is willing to continue the conflict for as long as possible in order not just to help Ukraine but to defeat Russia strategically on the battlefield. Having said that, in the most recent interview that the Russian Foreign Minister Sergei Lavrov has given, Lavrov was speaking about the possibility of the negotiations. Once again, we are getting these statements uh, from the Russian side that Moscow is willing to engage in the talks but says there is nobody on the Ukrainian side to talk to but just the rhetoric that we are getting is obviously very helpful to see the situation actually coming to terms in the coming uh, in the coming months perhaps maybe weeks but certainly Russia says that as long as Ukraine is pumped up with weapons the more difficult it is to get to the negotiating table but Moscow hopes that the Western countries would be willing to push Ukraine and to get back to the negotiation solution for this Ukrainian conflict. In the meantime, the operation will continue. If Ukraine gets more weapons, it will last even longer. All right, we leave it at that. Uh, Dasha, thank you. That was Dasha Chernyshova reporting from Moscow. And in some more news from Russia and Ukraine, Russia's defense ministry says it will set up a science and production center for drones and robotic complexes. Russia's Defense Minister Shoigu inspected a testing range for firearms and drones in the Moscow military district. The Russia-Ukraine conflict has witnessed heavy drone deployment with thousands of unmanned aerial vehicles used to track enemy forces, guide artillery and bomb targets. The tiny, inexpensive first-person view drone has proved to be a, one of the most potent weapons in this conflict. Meanwhile, Ukraine's President Volodymyr Zelensky has told the NATO members that his country needed a minimum of seven Patriot or other high-end air defense systems to counter Russian airstrikes. He urged them on Friday to step up their military assistance for Kyiv. We are telling this directly to defend. We need seven more Patriots or similar air defense systems. And it's a minimum number. They can save many lives and really change situation. 
You have such systems? Please, from the beginning of this year alone, a bit more than just three months, Ukraine has been hit with almost 1,200 Russian rockets, including air ballistic, and also more than 1,500 Shahids. Part of this evil we, we managed to neutralize, shoot down, but only a part. After a special meeting of Allied Defense Ministers with Ukraine's President Volodymyr Zelensky, NATO Chief Jens Stoltenberg has said that the NATO allies have agreed to provide Kyiv with additional air defense systems. NATO defense ministers have agreed to step up and provide further military support, including more air defense. NATO has mapped out existing capabilities across the alliance and there are systems that can be made available to Ukraine. So expect new announcements on air defense capabilities for Ukraine soon. In addition to Patriots, there are other weapons that allies can provide, including SAMTs. And many allies have, uh, who do not have available systems have pledged uh, to provide financial support to purchase them uh, for Ukraine. Right, from one conflict to another, the G7 foreign ministers warn Iran that it could face further sanctions if it does anything to destabilize West Asia and the Gulf. Now, at the end of a three-day meeting on the Italian island of Capri, the G7 also pledged to help Ukraine with its air defenses. DD India's Giles Gibson sent us this report. It was a last-minute change to the agenda of the final day of talks here on the island of Capri when reports started coming in of an apparent Israeli missile strike on central Iran. By the end of the talks, we had a joint statement from the G7 foreign ministers in which they warned Iran that further sanctions would be placed on their economy if they were responsible for any more destabilizing actions within the Middle East. Uh, first, the G7 condemned the unprecedented uh, Iranian attack on Israel, unprecedented in scope and scale. Scope because it was a direct attack on Israel from Iran, scale because it involved more than 300 uh, munitions, including ballistic missiles. We're committed to Israel's security. We're also committed to de-escalating. I immediately wanted there to be a clear message from the entire G7. The political objective of the G7 is called de-escalation. We have been working, we are working and we will continue to work to be active players for de-escalation in the whole Middle East area. Of course, on Thursday, even before these talks wrapped up, we also saw the US and the UK moving forward with a fresh round of combined sanctions on Iran. Uh, in that final statement, we also had the G7 calling for a, a sustainable ceasefire in Gaza, uh, for Hamas to release hostages that have already been held, of course, for many months, and for, quotes, concrete steps to be taken by the Israeli government to allow more aid to flow into Gaza. Uh, meanwhile, this week, we've also had the Ukrainian Foreign Minister Dmitry Kuleba taking part in the G7 talks, in particular urging his allies to provide his country with more air defense systems. And the G7 have now pledged to help Ukraine to bolster their air defense capabilities. However, at the end of these talks, we did not have any sign of an agreement about how to potentially leverage $300 billion of frozen Russian assets in the West to help Ukraine with their war efforts. Uh, we did in the final statement from the G7 foreign ministers, though, have a commitment. Uh, they are saying that they are going to aim to have an agreement, a deal uh, around how to use those $300 billion of frozen Russian assets by the time we get to the G7 leaders summit, which is coming up in June in southern Italy. Giles Gibson on the island of Capri reporting for DD India. Now, as for Iran, its Foreign Minister Hossein Amir Abdullahian has said that Iran will respond at an immediate and maximum level if Israel acts against its interests. In an interview to a U.S. media, the Iranian minister said if Israel becomes adventurous and acts against the interests of its country, then Iran's next response would be immediate and at the maximum level. His comments followed reports of an Israeli strike on Iran on Friday. 
The Iranian minister said that Tehran was investigating the attack on Iran and that so far a link to Israel had not been proven. He sought to downplay the strike. Iranian media and officials alike describe a small number of explosions which they said resulted from Iran's air defenses hitting three drones over Isfahan in central Iran in the early hours of Friday. They refer to the incident as an attack by infiltrators rather than by Israel, averting the need for any retaliation. Now, as the Israel-Hamas conflict continues, Hamas's chief Ismail Haniyeh reached the Turkish city of Istanbul on Friday for talks with Turkey's President Recep Tayyip Erdogan. The Hamas said in a statement that Erdogan and Haniyeh would discuss the Gaza conflict and that the head of the group's political bureau was accompanied by a delegation. Turkey's foreign minister Hakan Fidan was in Qatar on Wednesday. The minister spent three hours with Haniyeh and his aides for talks on a ceasefire and the release of hostages. Now, Iraq's popular mobilization forces said that its command post at the Kalso military base, about 50 kilometers south of Baghdad, was hit by a huge explosion late on Friday local time. An explosion in the Babylon governorate resulted in the death of one PMF fighter and left eight wounded. It was not known who was responsible for the airstrike. Meanwhile, a U.S. official said that there had been no U.S. military activity in Iraq. Still to come on DD India News Hour. The U.S. slapped sanctions on Chinese companies and a firm based in Belarus for supplying missile technologies to Pakistan. Fighting rages at Myanmar's eastern border with Thailand forces 200 civilians to flee. And married couples sue Japan's government for forcing them to adopt a single surname. We just don't bring you the news as it unfolds. We get to the heart of the matter. We don't just present facts. We demystify complex social, political and economic events. We break stories that shape the world's present and future because you deserve the truth. I am Tanvi Taneja from New Delhi. I'm Oli Barrett from London. I'm Nick Harper from Washington, D.C. Join us on DD India Global Monday to Friday at these times. You're watching DD India News Hour. I'm Ramesh Ramachandran. After nearly a week of discussions, a jury and a handful of alternates have been selected in Donald Trump's hush money trial. When Friday's proceedings were on, a man set himself on fire outside the court. It was said that the man was a conspiracy theorist and did not believe that his actions were related to the former U.S. president. Opening statements in Trump's criminal trial could begin on Monday. DD India's William Denslow has more from New York City. During legal proceedings on a Friday, the key issue that needed to be resolved was finding the six alternates uh, to go along with the 12 members of the jury that were sworn in on a Thursday. That has now been achieved, which means that, according to Judge Juan Machan, we could see opening statements in Donald Trump's criminal hush money case, his trial, to begin as early as Monday. Those opening statements will provide the first opportunity for the defense and the prosecution to try and convince the jury of Donald Trump's innocence or his guilt. For the prosecution, they'll be seeking to successfully accuse Donald Trump of paying hush money to the porn star Stormy Daniels ahead of the 2016 elections. For the defense, they will seek to argue that the $130,000 that Donald Trump paid to his fixer at the time, Michael Cohen, was a legitimate business a legal expense. Donald Trump has pleaded not guilty to 34 counts of falsifying business records. Also to be established is Judge Machan will make rulings on what exactly 
uh, people can ask Donald Trump if indeed he chooses to take the witness stand during this trial. There's also the matter of the gag order on Donald Trump. He says that it is unconstitutional. He says it is impacting his ability to defend himself and to politically campaign as he seeks re-election. This is really a concerted witch hunt, very simple. Everything you heard in there, this is a witch hunt by numerous judges, Democrat judges. You take a look at it, and Gorin is a whack job. What he did was a disgrace. It's being reviewed by the appellate division. And I hope they do justice because everybody's looking and nobody, no business is coming into the city. For the prosecution, well, they argue that Donald Trump has been violating that gag order that essentially seeks to block him from attacking witnesses uh, and during this trial. They've warned that such violations could result in Donald Trump even facing up to 30 days behind bars. Judge Juan Machan is expected to hold a hearing on that matter on Tuesday. William Denslow in New York reporting for DD India. The United States has imposed sanctions on three Chinese companies and a Belarus-based firm for supplying missile applicable items to Pakistan. The Minsk wheel tractor plant in Belarus supplied uh, special vehicle chassis to Pakistan's long-range ballistic missile program. Such chassis are used as launch support equipment for ballistic missiles by Pakistan's National Development Complex, which is responsible for the development of missile technology control regime Category 1 ballistic missiles. Fighting raged at Myanmar's eastern border with Thailand on Saturday, forcing 200 civilians to flee as rebels pressed to flush out the junta holdup for days near a border crossing. Resistance fighters and ethnic minority rebels seized the key trading town of Miawadi on the Myanmar side of the frontier on 11th April, dealing a big blow to a well-equipped military that's struggling to govern and is now facing a critical test of its battlefield credibility. Three witnesses on the Thai and Myanmar sides of the border said that they heard explosions and heavy machine gun fire near a strategic bridge from late on Friday that continued into early Saturday local time. Several Thai media outlets said that about 200 people had crossed the border to seek temporary refuge in Thailand. And DD India's Nawal Singh Parmar joins us from Dhaka in Bangladesh for more. What more can you tell us about the situation at the Myanmar-Thailand border as we speak? Uh, actually, Myanmar junta uh, government, uh, after the coup in uh, 2021, facing the toughest uh, challenge from the uh, armed rebellious group uh, uh, as the uh, Operation 1027, uh, which is started on 27 October, by the uh, Three Brotherhood Alliance, a coordinated atta attack on the military junta. And uh, Arakan Army and other two groups are the uh, three uh, components of the Three Brotherhood Alliance. And uh, as earlier, uh, earlier they uh, covered the most of the areas in northern San state and Kachin and Arakan state uh, near to Myanmar, uh, near to Bangladesh and India border, which is uh, uh, Arakan, Rakhine province, uh, other name is Rakhine province. Now, uh, the, the rebellion group are attacking uh, on the junta, uh, military junta of Myanmar, Tatwameda, from the eastern border. And uh, due to that, the people and the border guard people of uh, Myanmar are facing tough challenge from the uh, junta, uh, from the rebellious group. And uh, as you mentioned that uh, 200, more than 200 people crossed the eastern border uh, uh, to the Thailand. And the same way, the uh, last week, around 274 uh, border guard uh, police of Myanmar crossed the border uh, 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 to Bangladesh. And now they are taking refuge in Bangladesh. Bangladesh uh, border guard has uh, disarmed them and they are now in, in their custody. Earlier also, around 330 uh, uh, officials from the Myanmar side, border guard police, uh, immigration staff and the uh, army person uh, crossed the Bangladesh border, Myanmar Bangladesh border, and took refuge in Bangladesh. Uh, in the 15 February, uh, Myanmar government took them back to, to Myanmar side, and now the Myanmar junta is facing uh, uh, tough fight from uh, bordering area. Either it is uh, Indian side, Indian 
Myanmar India border or Myanmar Bangladesh border or Myanmar China border or now it is Thailand uh, Myanmar border. Yes. Right, we leave it at that. Naval Singh Parmar in Dhaka. Thank you for now. Appreciate it. In Japan, six couples are suing the country's government over a law forcing them to adopt a single surname after marriage. They're arguing that the centuries-old custom disproportionately affects women who are more likely to give up their surnames in favor of the husbands. DD India's Chris Gilbert reports from Tokyo. Nizu-san and Kurokawa-san have been together for 30 years. But they've chosen not to get married because they want to keep their own surnames, which aren't actually Nezu or Kurokawa. Those are pseudonyms to protect them from blowback as they sue the state. I feel this is something we should not pass on to the next generation. There are so many people suffering. That's why we took on this lawsuit. They've been in a de facto marriage for 18 years, but are missing out on the legal protections of a married couple. It's hard for non-married couples to get a joint home loan. We're ineligible for many tax deductions married couples enjoy. Also, if one of us becomes ill, the other may not have the power to make medical decisions. The law does not dictate who must give up their family name upon marriage, but government data shows it's usually women. In 2019, 95% of newlyweds adopted the husband's surname for their new family. Critics argue this can impact their career, as many attempt to continue working using their pre-marriage surname. Going through the courts has been tried before. Lawsuits in 2017 and 2021 also pushed for married couples to keep their own surnames. And they were both dismissed with the courts ruling it was an issue for Parliament. But experts believe this time might be different. Though they've lost many times before, the argument that the political route isn't working has become quite strong and public opinion is on the side of change. Many legal experts see a chance of success. Kurokawa-san is frustrated with lawmakers. The politics on this isn't moving. There's no option for us but to knock on the doors of the judiciary again and again. The case has extra momentum with big business on side. The country's biggest lobby saying the law should have been changed years ago. A court date for the first hearing is yet to be set. Chris Gilbert in Tokyo reporting for DD India. And now take a look at what else is making news around the world. The cast of Fox's hit series Family Guy walks the red carpet at the famous Dolby Theatre in Los Angeles, California on Friday, celebrating their 25th anniversary. With 22 seasons on air and a few bouts with cancellations, Family Guy is still one of the longest-running animated series on TV. The assembly of the world's largest digital astronomy camera has been finished and set to be shipped to its new location atop a 8,900-foot mountain in Chile. Known as a Legacy Survey of Space and Time Camera, it will have the capacity to generate 1,000 images and yield 15 to 20 terabytes of data nightly. Scientists will use this cutting-edge technology to study dark energy, dark matter, galaxy distribution and other cosmic phenomena. An iron robot enables doctors to navigate through the lungs using a virtual map generated from a CT scan performed during the screening. Additionally, it offers a real-time visualization of the lungs as the catheter advances into the bronchial tubes, providing valuable insights during procedures. This advancement holds the potential to detect cancers at an early stage, thereby saving lives through timely intervention. And still to come on DD India News Up. Scrutiny of nominations for phase three of India's election is being held on Saturday. And exiled Tibetan spiritual leader, the Dalai Lama, holds a teaching session in northern India. Is left-wing 
extremism close to its end game now and our nexalites breathing their last breath it was a combined effort of so many militant so many nexalite guerrilla groups who try to disrupt our our uh, election process we are used to listening this kind of thing from people who are part of the urban network but when it comes from very responsible people it's very heart wrenching for sure for all the men in uniform uh, i mean it's reprehensible actually You're watching DD India News Hour. I'm Ramesh Ramachandran. A quick recap of the headlines. India's Prime Minister Narendra Modi holds election rallies in Maharashtra and Karnataka. Opposition leader Rahul Gandhi holds a public meeting at Bhagalpur in Bihar. Iran says it will respond at maximum level if Israel acts against its interests, lays down the reported Israeli attacks. and fighting rages at Myanmar's border with Thailand forces 200 civilians to flee All right let's now get you the latest on the world's largest democratic election in India Polling in India, the world's largest democracy began on Friday. Nearly a billion people were eligible to cast their vote in the first phase of the election. Polling concludes on the 1st of June and votes will be counted on the 4th of June. Polling for phase 1 of the seven phase election concluded on April 19th in the world's largest democracy. Voters across 102 constituencies across 21 states and union territories in India took part in the voting process. Nearly 62% voter turnout was seen and long queues gathered were observed around the country where people gathered to exercise their right. Men and women alike were seen standing in queues to participate in this festival of democracy. बहुत हमारे लिए बहुत जरूरी है हमारे आने वाले बच्चों के लिए भी बहुत जरूरी है वोट देने के लिए political leaders also made their way to the polling station to cast their vote by and large the election was peaceful barring a few untoward incidents in shillong people said the development and better future of children were key issues for them and keeping them in mind they voted in this election voting also took place to elect new legislative assemblies in arunachal pradesh and sikkim on friday my main uh, aim is to see to it that children do well in life fair well in life so the education uh, the field of education that is it it matters a lot we are voting for the betterment of our children's future because as we we have already you know we have come to that age that now we have to think for our ch- ch- kids and children so that's what we have voted for. probably we have voted to the right person action commission of india also set up model polling stations in many parts of the state these polling stations have wheelchair facility selfie booths to attract young and first time voters sitting rooms for senior citizens and even feeding rooms for babies the second phase of the marathon election will be held on april 26 with 89 parliamentary seats up for grab in 13 states the following phase of voting will take place on may 7 may 13 may 20 may 25 and the last phase on june 1 the counting will take place on june 4 All right, let's now connect uh, you with our correspondents on the ground. Let me first take you to Chennai down south where my colleague Anbarasan Elango is standing by. Anbarasan, what's the mood like in Tamil Nadu the day after the polling? What have political parties been saying about the voting? As you know that the polling is ended as yesterday itself uh, the election commission given the overall the voting turnout in around uh, 7 p.m. Uh, the 72 percentage but after that around our uh, 12 am after calculating all the data the voter the election commission has given that the voter turnout is uh, reduced into the 69 percentage and also the voter turnout in the urban Sorry, seats like uh, coimbatore uh, chennai central and chennai south significantly the voter turnout has been reduced from around 10 percent 
it has become a it's a abnormal so actually because the 2019 14 didn't happen so the political parties particularly the bjp uh, the candidate of coimbatore k annamalai state uh, chief and also the chennai south candidate tamilisi sundarajan are uh, given a memorandum to the polling uh, returning offices and all to raise the issue that uh, some of the polling stations the uh, voter list a uh, lot of voters uh, names has been uh, removed and uh, some of the list has been uh, uh, so totally uh, annamalai said that around 1 lakh voters has been removed in the coimbatore constituency uh, replying to that the election commissioner uh, sitepada sagu has said that uh, actually the 1000 uh, if any polling booth is having more than 1500 vote, voters uh some of the voters may be uh, shifted to the nearing another new polling booths so it may be some issue that some voters may normally go to the polling polling booths where they previously voted this time maybe they shifted to the new polling booth so these kind of issues may happen and also the all the parties also raising this issue of why suddenly the voter turnout has been reduced into 69 said that uh, some of the polling booths uh, the data has been collected on a, a returning officer level and sent to the district and after district to the state so it takes some time then only the final out uh, turnover uh, voter turnout will be released release and the election commission has released totally 69.20 percentage of vote uh, voter has been recorded in the uh, lok sabha election of all the 39 constituency right. in bilavangoda also the voting has been completed uh we need to see that right. the election uh, result is been uh, june 4th the political parties are very much and the what uh, evm machines are given in every uh, 39 okay. constituency 39 uh, strong point uh, uh, where the evm has been uh, stored the political parties also are waiting that right. to save god that we need to see for june 14th uh, june 4th on right. the result of the lok sabha all right we leave it at that anbaras and elango in chennai thank you Meanwhile political parties have begun campaigning for the second phase of election to be held on 26th of April on Saturday Prime Minister Narendra Modi attended a public rally in Bengaluru city in the southern state of Karnataka Earlier in the day the PM also held public meetings at Nanded and Parbhani in the western state of Maharashtra highlighting the achievements of the party the pm urged voters to come out in large numbers for taking part in what he called the festival of democracy sinchai ki samasya ke samadhan ke liye upper pan ganga project par kaam chal raha hai yahan ke kisano ko iska bada labh milega hamari sarkar ne fasal bima yojana ke tahat kisano ko premium se पांच गुना ज्यादा क्लेम दिलवाया है किसान सम्मान निधि के तहत अकेले नांदेड़ के किसानों को ही 1300 करोड़ रुपए से ज्यादा मिले हैं इस क्षेत्र में तो ज्वार बाजरा बहुत होता है हमारी सरकार ने इस मोटे अनाज को पूरे देश में एक पहचान दी है उसके लिए पहचान दी है श्री अन्न चाहे ज्वार हो बाजरा हो वो श्री अन्न का के साथ पहचाने जाए और जब से ये काम शुरू किया है दुनिया भर में लोगों का ध्यान हमारे श्री अन्न पर गया है अनदर बीजेपी लीडर एंड द कंट्रीज होम मिनिस्टर अमित शाह एड्रेस्ड ए पब्लिक गैदरिंग इन कोटा लोकेटेड इन द वेस्टर्न स्टेट ऑफ राजस्थान ऑन सैटरडे saying that the ruling government's initiatives uh, he said that under pmo these leadership the state is moving towards development minister shah also took part in a rally in bhilwara city earlier in the day he was confident that prime minister narendra modi would be elected for the third consecutive time on the other hand opposition leader rahul gandhi held a public meeting at bhagalpur in bihar He was to address a public meeting at Amroha in Uttar Pradesh later in the day. Another Congress leader Priyanka Gandhi held rallies at Chalakudi and Pattanamthitta in the southern state of Kerala. She will hold a road show in Tiruvananthapuram the capital of the state as well. Right uh, joining me from uh, two states uh, Maharashtra in the west 
and West Bengal in the East are my colleagues Yogesh Sheetal and Prasenjit Bakshi. To you first, Yogesh, uh, what more can you tell us about Prime Minister Modi's rallies earlier in the day in Maharashtra at Nanded and Parbhani? Uh, see, Ramesh, uh, the PM basically given a uh, you know complete account of the works that have been completed over the last 10 years and especially given emphatic on how uh, the road infrastructure projects, railway infrastructure projects, medical infrastructure projects and the entire agrarian things because in Marathwada, the entire region is completely uh, you know uh, dependent on agrarian things, agriculture, irrigation, crops issues, debt issues, farmer debt issues. So all the interrelated issues are quite significant when it comes to election and when it comes to campaigning by a top leader. So all the things were uh, broadly mentioned in his speech and especially giving a, a road map for the another five years. The PM had made it very clear that in the ten in the last ten years the things the, you know the, basically the infrastructure the uh, the things have been set up on the place and another five years like forty thousand houses have been built through PM Awas Yojan, multiple projects that have been projects and schemes that have been extended to the people, basically poor people. So you also said that in the time to come, in the another five years, uh, the, the government will ensure that three crore more houses are built and uh, given to the people. On the same line, other uh, things like uh, uh, railway infrastructure, the Yavatma railway, basically the broad uh, railway from uh, Yavatmal, Nanded to Vardha, that was the highly weighted and that was long pending for years and years and years and then uh, after 2014, a lot of the steps have been taken and the pipeline projects basically were cleared one by one. So PM also given complete account of these things. At the same time, also countered and taken a you know, sharp jab at the position on the issues, basically farmer issues, indirectly giving a signal that how NCP, when Sharad Pawar was the uh, minister in the center and also how uh, the other party, basically Congress, how the Nizam rules basically, uh, which is because if you see particularly in Marathwara region, Marathwara was never under the British rule. The Nizam rules was there and uh, it was a co Congress bastion for a long time. Later on, Bala Saab Thakre emerged as a big leader in Maharashtra and lot of basically the Maratha, you know, uh, people. They uh, got united and that this was the main, this is the, you know, the base, uh, base, base of Shiv Sena, UBT, that is Uddhav Balasab Thakri. You know that Shiv Sena has been splitted into two parts now, Shiv Sena, Uddhav Balasab Thakri, that is old Shiv Sena and the new Shiv Sena that is led by Eknath Shinde. Right. So this is completely also going to be a litmus test for both the Shiv Sena at this point in time. So PM also underlined that point also. So a lot of things have been covered and a lot of uh, rallies are also lined up. Uh, tomorrow uh, uh, there are some Congress rallies, the top leaders are going to address rallies in Buldhana, the Nakola, then other regions where uh, you know the eight constituencies are going to cast their votes on the uh, on the second February 26. This is going to be very interesting in terms of Marathwara that uh, that will definitely decide the fate of both the parties, both the alliances at Indeed. this time. Indeed. Yeah, over to you, Ramesh. Yogesh, do stay on. Let me bring in Prasenjit Bakshi who joins us from West Bengal. Prasenjit, what more can you tell us about phase two of the election to be held on the 26th of April in West Bengal? How many seats will go to the polls and what kind of preparations have been made to ensure free and fair elections in the state for the phase two in particular? Uh, look, Ramesh, uh, in the second phase also, uh, West Bengal will have uh, three constituencies. These are Darjeeling, Darjeeling uh, famous for your uh, um, uh, tourism and tea purpose, and the other two are uh, Balurghat and uh, uh, Raiganj constituencies. Uh, now, uh, the point is that uh, uh, one positive part of uh, first phase of election of West Bengal is that, that it went on peacefully. Peace is very um, uh, serious issue for West Bengal, as you know that uh, here uh, election-related, poll-related violence is notorious for last uh, several decades. But this time, uh, in the first phase, uh, yesterday happened, uh, that went on peacefully, more or less. And uh, that is a, uh, you know, I must say that that is a uh, boost of uh, factor for the election commission and the political parties also. And um, particularly in this uh, second phase of election, uh, Darjeeling, uh, Darjeeling is a type of a uh, constituency where the topography is of different uh, quality. One is the hill region. Himalayan region and other is the plain region. So uh, the challenge is different type of challenge. And uh, um, uh, the, the, uh, the, the, the Balurghat constituency where from the uh, uh, incumbent uh, uh, member of parliament, Sukanta Majumdar is also president of, state president of Bharatiya Janta Party. So it is a prestigious uh, contest for him. 
but this constituency is a constituency is absolutely um, uh, by the side of bangladesh border right. that is also a challenge for security purpose Indeed. and other purpose also uh, so uh, in that way preparation is uh, very strong on behalf of the election commission uh, good number of uh, central armed paramilitary forces is uh, deployed and they are already um, there and they are uh, having their uh, domination uh, area domination process so we hope that uh, uh, a peaceful election will right. be there on on the second phase that right. is on 26 Indeed. Ramesh. I'm afraid that's all we have time for. I will have to leave with that. Uh, Yogi Shrithal in Maharashtra and Prasenjit Bakshi in West Bengal. Thank you very much. Appreciate it. And in some more news related to the elections, scrutiny of nominations for phase three is being held on Saturday. The third phase will be held on the 7th of May. It will encompass 94 constituencies across 12 states and union territories. Assam, Bihar, Chhattisgarh, Dadra and Nagar Haveli, Daman and Diu, Goa, Gujarat, Jammu and Kashmir, Karnataka, Maharashtra, Madhya Pradesh, Uttar Pradesh and West Bengal will go to the polls in this phase. That's the third phase. All right, now take a look at what else is making news in India. A New Delhi court on Saturday reserved its order on the bail plea of AAP leader Manish Sisodia in corruption and money laundering cases registered against him. A special judge reserved the order for 30th April after hearing the arguments from the investigating agencies and the counsel appearing for Mr. Sisodia. The death toll in a boat capsized in Odisha's Charsugoda district rose to seven with the recovery of five more bodies on Saturday. The incident occurred when 50 passengers hailing from a neighboring state were returning from a temple in Odisha's Bargad district. The INS Utkrosh, a Indian Navy air station, has conducted a anti-hijack mock exercise with various participation at Port Blair in the Andaman and Nicobar Islands. The Airport Authority of India, Intelligence Bureau, Andaman Police, the CISF and representatives from airlines operating in the country also took part in the exercise and they showcased their preparedness to take on challenges. And exiled Tibetans and Torits alike gathered in the northern Indian hill town of Dharamshala to attend the teachings delivered by the Tibetan spiritual leader, the Dalai Lama, on Friday. Organized at the request of Mongolian Buddhist monks, the two-day event attracted tourists from all over the world to attend this spiritual discourse. In some more news from South Asia, the archipelago of Maldives is a bus with preparations for its fourth multi-party parliamentary elections to be held on Sunday. Eight political parties are vying for control of the People's Majlis, that's the Parliament of Maldives, fielding a total of 368 candidates across 93 constituencies. The incumbent President Dr. Mohammad Moizu has been emphasizing the importance of securing a pro-government majority in the country's parliament. A total of 602 polling stations have been set up across uh, the nation and the three stationed overseas in Colombo, Sri Lanka, Tiruvannathapuram in India and Kuala Lumpur in Malaysia. And still to come on DD India News Hour. A resurgent Delhi Capitals faces tough Sunrisers Hyderabad test in the IPL on Saturday. The southern state of Kerala goes to polls on a single day. 20 Lok Sabha seats are for grabs. Will the left be able to regain this bastion? Can BJP make inroads into God's own country? Watch Why Kerala Matters in the Great Indian Election on Monday at 8.30 p.m. ISD and 1500 hours GMT only on DD India. You're watching DD India News Hour. I'm Ramesh Ramachandran. Tesla CEO Elon Musk on Saturday said that his visit to India has been delayed. 
In a post on X, Musk said, and I quote, Unfortunately, very heavy Tesla obligations require that the visit to India be delayed, but I do very much look forward to visiting later this year, unquote. And talking about Tesla, the company is recalling more than 3,800 cyber trucks because of a defect that can cause unintended acceleration, increasing the risk of crashing. The issue is with the accelerator pedal, which might get stuck on the cyber truck, Elon Musk's version of the American pickup. Tesla, in a notice to the National Highway Traffic Safety Administration, said that if the accelerator pedal becomes trapped, the performance and operation of the pedal will be affected, which may increase the risk of collision. Tesla said it had no knowledge of any accidents or injuries linked to the problem. The company now plans to fix the issue by either replacing or adjusting the accelerator. Alphabet Incorporation's Google has now said that it will roll back requirements that U.S. suppliers and staffing firms pay their employees at least $15 per hour and provide health insurance and other benefits, a move that could allow the tech giant to avoid bargaining with unions. Google said that the elimination of the 2019 policy, along with other steps, such as limiting access by temporary workers and vendors to internal systems, are designed to comply with shifting U.S. and global labor regulations related to contingent workers. The announcement comes after the U.S. National Labor Relations Board in January ruled that Google was a so-called joint employer of workers provided by staffing firm Cognizant Technology Solutions and must bargain with their union. Google is appealing that decision. And now to all the news from the world of sport. India's Yuki Bhambri and his French partner Albano Oliviti have confirmed their place in the men's doubles final of the Munich Open. The duo enter the final by beating the players from Austria 6-1, 6-7, 10-7. This win will further strengthen Yuki Bhambri's chance of qualifying for the Paris Olympics in the doubles. Yuki Bhambri and Olivethi have been in fine form of late. Earlier in the first round, they beat the finalists of the French Open and the champions of the Monte Carlo Masters. The ATP 250 Munich Open final will take place on Sunday. The top three finishers of the Beijing Half Marathon have been stripped of their medals after an investigation into the controversial result. China's He Ji crossed the finish line of last Sunday's race in one hour, three minutes and 44 seconds to claim a gold medal and a $5,500 first prize. Now, a video clip of the finish shows Kenya's Willie Menangath turning toward He and gesturing for him to move ahead as the four men run neck and neck. Former 5-kilometer world record holder Robert Keita, also from Kenya, then appears to wave at he to overtake the pack. The video caused an online uproar in China, with many calling for an investigation and demanding action from the organizers. In the Indian Premier League, Delhi Capitals will take on Sunrisers Hyderabad in the 35th match of the IPL in New Delhi. Capitals has had a mixed season so far. But a couple of impressive wins against Lucknow Super Giants and Gujarat Titans have put it back in the mix with three wins and four defeats in seven outings so far. Meanwhile, Sunrisers Hyderabad have set a different template altogether with two of the highest ever totals of 277 for three and 287 for three, which will require a lot of hard and skill to counter. Captain Rishabh Pant will have to use his resources with extreme caution and guile on a Kotla track, which for a change will have a good bounce and carry. The Olympic flame arrived at Greece's most famous landmark, the Acropolis, on Friday as part of the 11 day relay across Greece ahead of the Paris Olympic Games. Former European 400 meters hurdles champion Pericles Yakovakis lit a cauldron in front of the Panthenon temple from his torch. The torch for the Paris Olympic Games was lit in ancient Olympia in a traditional ceremony on the 16th of April. It will be officially handed over to Paris Games organizers in Athens' Panathenaic Stadium on the 26th of April. The French torch relay will last 68 days and will end in Paris with the lighting of the Olympic flame on 26th July. 
Meanwhile, ahead of the upcoming Paris Olympics, IOC President Thomas Bach on Friday said he is confident that the French authorities will deliver a safe Olympic Games. But he said there will be issues over the use of artificial intelligence for security purposes. Bach also said that AI will revolutionize sport, but not so much that he could be replaced by it as president of the organization. Meanwhile, Wednesday marked 100 days to go until the Paris Olympic Games begin with preparations for the Games entering the final stage. Like I said before, the Games will open on the 26th of July. Uh, security is uh, in the authority of uh, the, uh, uh, the, the authorities in the host uh, country and uh, there, you know, we don't have uh, the skills and uh, the means uh, there to make a, a judgment on what are the best uh, tools uh, to apply to secure the games. Uh, what we have seen uh, from uh, the French government and from the authorities is uh, that uh, the, the efforts uh, to ensure uh, security uh, in Paris are uh, uh, really on a very wide scope, are very professional. So we have uh, all confidence in the French authorities to have safe and secure and then enjoyable games. Now focused on developing the next line of quality riders and picking the best India team for next year's Asian Continental Championships, the Equestrian Federation of India announced an extensive calendar of 41 competitions for the 2024-25 season that includes many firsts. The 24-25 season will start on 11th of August with the Sapta Shakti Horse Show in Jaipur and the AEF Under-21 Show Jumping Competition scheduled for October 12 and 13. Meanwhile, the Dreshas meet will take place at the Army Polo and Riding Centre from November 28 to the 1st of December. The EFI will also be introducing the Para Dressage competitions for the first time with the first event to be held from 18th to 20th of October. Before we close, uh, crowds cheered as elephants were decorated with umbrellas at Hindu temples in the southern Indian state of Kerala. People celebrated Trishur Puram on Saturday where priests conducted rituals as crowds gathered to witness the annual procession. The festival is held every year between April and May on the auspicious Puram Day. And with that, it's a wrap on this edition of DD India News. For those of you on the go, you can get all the latest news and updates on the DD India mobile app. The app is available on both Android and iOS platforms. You can scan the QR code to download this app. Let us know your thoughts on the news of the day. You can connect with us on Facebook, X and Instagram. You can also check out our website ddindia.co.in. We'll be back with more news as it breaks here on DD India. I'm Ramesh Ramachandran. From all of us here in New Delhi, thanks for watching DD India News Hour.